Uh, we're in a series, and we've been speaking about being a real disciple of Jesus. And what we're looking at is becoming an unstoppable um, disciple with unshakable faith. An unstoppable disciple. That means it doesn't matter what you're going through, the enemy can't stop you. How many want to be an unstoppable disciple? Because your faith is unshakable. Now, it doesn't mean you're unshakable. Sometimes you get hit, you shake a bit. But what we're saying is your faith is unshakable. Meaning, doesn't matter what I go through, I know that God is God. That I know that God is not in heaven uh, worrying about these things. And so what we need in our day and age today is unstoppable disciples with unshakable faith. That means if you go through something, you don't stop praying. You don't stop coming to church. You don't stop reading your Bible. Can I get an amen? That you keep going because things are going to hit you. Things will go wrong. Things go up and down. But to become an unstoppable disciple with unshakable faith. If you know anything about church history, there's a period of time when Christians were burnt at the stake. Where Christians were put on uh, 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 um, uh, 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 the cross. Where Christians would be martyred. Christians would go through this. And, but they did not quit. They just kept going. And that's why we have Bibles today. That's why we still have Christianity today. Because these people didn't quit. They were unstoppable disciples with unshakable faith. Let me just make this statement here. No matter what you are going through today, God can fulfill you. It doesn't matter what you're going through today, God can fulfill you. No matter what your financial situation is. Doesn't matter what your, the state of your marriage is. Doesn't matter what's going on in your health. God can still fulfill you. That you can still be fulfilled in God. And this is a, a, a fundamental thing. Now let me say this. And what we're going to learn about as we've done poor in spirit. And we've done mourning. Uh, the blessing of those who mourn. And then we've done those that are meek. Is that. If there is a problem, and you're going to hear me say this a lot over the next few weeks. If there's a problem, you've got to go back to the foundation. When there's a problem, when you're like, oh no, pastor, I can't serve God. What's it? It's, it's my marriage. No, 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 no. When there's a problem and it's affecting you, you're becoming not an unstoppable disciple with unshakable faith. You've got to go back to the foundation. And I spoke about this a few weeks ago that many Christians are trying to build this Christian life without Christian foundation. They're trying to bring up Christian children without a Christian foundation. You're trying to have a Christian marriage without a Christian foundation. You're trying to build Christian friendships. And so if things start to go wrong, you need to go back and look at the foundation. And so we're back in Matthew 5 verse 3. Uh, if you've got it, say amen. Matthew 5 verse 3 says this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We've dealt with that. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We've dealt with that. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is where we're going, this is where we're going to be staying, where we're going to be living today. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be Filled. Let's pray. Father, we ask you right now for your grace, your mercy. I pray, Father, you would speak to us today. Father, I pray this be more than information. Let it be transformation. Father, transact with us, Lord. I pray that you would deposit something within us that we would see you high and lifted up. Holy Spirit, glorify Jesus. Jesus, bring us more to the Father that we would have contentment and peace and joy and all the promises that you've given us in your word. Father, we pray that you would do that and more in this service. And all God's people said, amen. Now, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think, but we're going to go into it a bit deeper. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And so we all know what hunger is, but let me, let me give a bit of a definition here. What we're talking about is a deep awareness that, I, that, that what I need is missing on the inside. That's what the Bible is saying. When it says hunger and thirst, that's what hunger is. Uh, uh, some of you are hungry now. Amen. But the reality of this is that when you, have a, when you feel a hunger, is that when you become aware that what I need on the inside is missing. And so Jesus is saying that this is what we have to be. We need to be a people who have this awareness of something is missing on the inside. We all know what it is to be hungry. 
How many know no one has to teach you to be hungry? No one taught anybody to be hungry because hunger is the basic sign that you're alive. Even a baby, when a baby is born, how many know babies are hungry? Mothers will know this. Mothers know the cry. That's a, that's a wet nappy cry. That's a, a, I need to feed the baby cry. They figured all of these. To me, it's just a cry. But they'll know exactly what that is. And newborn babies, as soon as they are born, they already have a hunger. Now, let's bring it to the spiritual side. That means the sign of spiritual life, the new birth, that you are a genuine Christian is that you have a hunger for spiritual things. You have a hunger for spiritual things. That is a genuine sign that something has happened to you, something has changed. More than just coming to church. More than just, oh, you know, I've made some Christian friends. I go to the Bible study. All those things are good. But I have something more. I came into a service like this, on a midweek service just like this, and I prayed to give my life to Jesus, and when I went home, within a week's time, there were things that I wanted to do that I didn't want to do the week before. I gained a hunger for coming to church. I gained a hunger for my Bible. I remember my uncle gave me a Bible, and I read that Bible till, the, till it wore out. I had never read a book before I got saved. And so hunger is the basic sign that something has come alive. Now, you... you, you when I was a baby, I had to be taught how to, how to feed. My, my, my parents taught me how to feed. You know what my mom did? She fed me, and then she'd give me the bottle, and then I had food, and you'd feed you. And they, they ha my mom had to teach me how to eat, how to feed. Someone had to feed me in the beginning. But no one had to teach me to be hungry. Now, why am I saying that? It's because we can teach you as a church how to feed yourself. We can teach you, you, this is how you read the Bible. We can teach you, this is how you pray. But we cannot teach you to be hungry. No one needs to teach someone to be hungry. If you are truly born again, you've come alive spiritually, you should have that hunger. You should have it already. We should not have to, to, to teach it to you. Hey, how come you're not hungry? If a baby is born and that baby never eats, never has an appetite, never takes the bottle, never takes the milk, never wants it, we would say, let's, let's, let's call the doctor. Something's not right here. Why? Then when people come to church, is, are we force feeding you? Are we force feeding you? You have no appetite for the Bible. You've been saved for a period of time and you still have no appetite for the Bible. You still have no appetite for prayer. You still have no appetite for sermons and for fellowship. We can teach you how to feed yourself, but we cannot teach you hunger. See, hunger is a sign of spiritual life. Look at what the Bible says, Psalms 63 verse 1. Psalm 63 Verse 1, the Bible says, God, you are my God, early will I seek you. I mean, it's good to seek God early in the morning. It's good to get up early and seek God. This, this, this person has a hunger, this person has a, is seeking God, but goes on and says this, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in the dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Look at the posture of this person. I want God like I thirst. I'm, uh, uh, many, many of us are going to Tucson a few weeks' time. When you go to Tucson, it's desert there. And there's nothing like it in this UK. We've never had anything like it. There's, even when it's hot like that, the dryness, is not, there's nothing like it. When you go there, and I've been to uh, Phoenix, and it's even hotter than Tucson, is you realize, my days, this is real desert. And the Bible is saying, imagine being in that desert place and how you would, how you would yearn for water. You would drink anything. You've become desperate. The Bible says... The follower of God is like that. That's how desperate they want God. Psalms 42 verse 1. Psalms 42 verse 1. 
As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you. Meaning I'm so thirsty for more of God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Again, same sentiment. Psalms 107, verse 9. 107, verse 9. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. What the Bible has shown us is that when we follow God, we should be hungry, longing. There should be a drivenness. You know, I would say, you know, I'm a pretty straightforward, normal type of guy. When I get hungry, I get distracted. How many, ever, how many know what you're talking about here? Some of you, you're not hungry, you're hangry. You get hangry, man. You get angry and hungry at the same time. When I'm hungry, I'm just like, my wife will be talking to me and she goes, I can see you're hungry now. I said, well, what's the matter, babe, man? I'm listening to you. She goes, no, no, I can see you're hungry. I can see you. Don't worry, don't worry. I'll, I'll feed you. Let me feed you. And then, he, and then I come alive again. You know, I'm not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not giving an excuse for just flesh. But, you know, when I'm hungry, I find it hard to concentrate. When I'm hungry, I'm easily distracted. The Bible says that the, 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 the follower of Christ, that when we look at your life, you should look hungry for God. He says there should be a longing. There should be something that you're driven for God. When you follow God, we sh- the world should see you and be like, there's something about this person. You look distracted. You look like you're, se- you're seeking and searching and driven by something else. I am. I'm hungry for God. That's what it should be like. Now, what Jesus says in this passage, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, And so when it comes to righteousness, we should not be content. It didn't say blessed are those who talk about righteousness or think that they're righteous. We should not be content. Sometimes what happens is this, is that people get saved, they start to do right, and then they look for the line of, of compromise and sin. So it's like, this is where I'm going to live. I'm going to live here. You know, I'm not sinning. Come on now. Don't be too religious, you know. But the Bible says this is not where we should be. The Bible says that we, if this is, if this is righteousness over here, we should be not looking and, and, and then sin is here. We should not be looking for the line. Like, where's the line here? No, you should be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You should never be content. You should always be seeking it, running after it, pursuing it. We should never get to the place where we think, nah, I'm okay here. And for the older saints, that's hard for us. That's hard for us, saints, because we get to the point now where we've been to conferences, we've been to revivals, we've watched a few sermons. Now we've arrived. I'm okay. I'm just okay. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not the right spirit to think you've arrived. In the Bible, Jesus spoke about two men. One was a Pharisee. One was a, a tax collector. One, the Pharisee starts to say, oh, you know, I thank God that this is what I do and I, I'm doing that. I'm a good guy. I'm fine. And then in Luke 18, verse 13, Luke 18, verse 13, Luke 18, 13, the Bible says this, and the tax collector standing afar off would not as much raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This guy, is, this guy wants it. He wants more of God. He's like, God, I need you. The, 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 the Pharisee was like, no, I'm cool, man. I'm cool. I go to church. I'm faithful to church. No, I'm good. The, 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 the tax collector says, I need you, God, please. I, I, I'm hungry for more of you. Verse 14, look what Jesus says. I tell you, this man, meaning the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. What Jesus is saying is that we should always have a hunger for righteousness. But pastor, I'm in the ministry. You should still hunger for righteousness. But pastor, I'm in praise and worship. I'm in the nursery. I'm an usher. I'm a Bible study leader. I've been saved a long time. You should still hunger for righteousness. That There's a constant hungering and thirsting for righteousness. What is this righteousness that Jesus is speaking about? 
Well, there's justification and sanctification. Justification means I'm made right by Christ, so I should hunger to be right with God. How many know we should just be hungry? We should be desperate to be right with God. You should be desperate to be right with God. I spoke to you guys about the mistake I made with my ticket, and then I had to call up um, Virgin and and rearrange my ticket. And so um, I wasn't able to get the same ticket. I, I made the mistake. Um, I booked the wrong month, and so now um, I, I, I've got the same ticket going out, but I have to fly back into Manchester to get the same ticket. I had to fly back into Manchester. I'm going to have to fly back into Manchester and then get from Manchester all the way to London. That's the only way it was going to get to do it. But think about it now. It, it, it wasn't enough that I was comfortable with it. Or think about it now. Let's put it like this. Say my, my wife, I booked the ticket, and so my wife had the confidence in me that, you know what, nah, well, you know, my husband says it's okay. But how many know it's not what I say? It's what Virgin says. We're going to get there and my wife would be, you know, because she's gracious. Some of you would, would, would strangle a man like that. But my wife is a, thank God. But the, the issue is this. The issue is not what I think or you think. The issue is what God thinks. You've got to make, you should be desperate to be right with God. Because at the end of our life, when you inhale and exhale your last breath, you know there will be a last breath. There will be a last breath. Every human being breathes a last breath. Every human being, every black person breathes a last breath. Every white person breathes a last breath. Even mixed race people, there's a few of them around, you know, breathe their last breath. Even rich people breathe their last breath. Rich, poor people, home, everybody breathes their last breath. On that last breath where you just, all that will matter was you right with God. All that will matter is, was you right with God. Not what these people thought of you. Was you right with God. That's the first priority. So we should be hungering and seeking and, oh, I, 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 I've got to be right with God. But the righteousness goes beyond that because what it speaks about is not only that you have made righteous, but that you live a righteous life. You should hunger and thirst to live a righteous life. Now let me go into this a little bit. Here is the problem what I have witnessed in, you know, I think it's not a modern Christian thing, it's just a, we all struggle with this, is that many church people like righteousness, but they're not hunger to live righteous. Many church people, they, they like righteousness. They like it, but they're not hungry for it. See, what happens is sometimes... What we're doing is we are seeking spiritual experiences more than righteous manifestation. What, let me, you are, where people come to church and they are seeking a spiritual experience. What I mean by that, they come to church and they want to meet good people. They want good music. They want good sermons. They want a good experience. They want a spiritual experience more than the manifestation of righteousness. Meaning, I'm going to go to that church and I'm going to experience something more than I'm going to go to church and tonight I'm going to leave and live more righteous. Did you come tonight so that you could learn from the scriptures how to live more righteous or did you come to have a spiritual experience? See, much of what we think is church now has become like theater and concerts. The lighting, the way we sit, the way it's presented. We come in and we want a spiritual experience. But really, we should be hungering for righteousness. I want to come to church and fellowship, and pray, and hear the words, so that this week I can manifest more righteous living in my life. That's what the Bible, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We like righteousness. Many Christians agree with righteousness, but they hunger for pleasure and happiness. They like righteousness, They agree with righteousness, but they don't hunger for it. There are men who call themselves Christians, but when they go online, 
they follow and like things They'll be looking at women who are half naked, take pictures of themselves in their underwear. Bro, you hunger for pleasure more than righteousness. You agree with righteousness, you like righteousness, but you hunger for pleasure more than righteousness. This is very deep because let me speak to some sisters here. Somebody went, uh oh. <laughs> the system that we live in in the world is that rather than make you hunger after, after righteousness, you'll like righteousness, you'll agree with righteousness, but your hunger is to be noticed and to be attractive. That is what you hunger for, is to be attractive. And what you've learned in the world is the more skin I show, the more attractive I am to men. It's gone quiet, isn't it? <laughs> if you say you hunger for righteousness, if we looked in your wardrobe... Would you, would, would you want to wear that? Now, let's not talk about church. Let's talk about when you're outside of church, when you go out. Are you looking at that outfit and saying, I'm just hungry to be more righteous, so this is what I'm going to wear? Or is it, I like righteousness, I agree with righteousness, but I hunger to be attractive. I hunger that when I arrive, people will notice me and look at me and say they're attractive. We must look at them. And, uh, and men, I've learned that the more skin I show, more men look at me. Can I, say, can I just say something here that I find a bit of a mystery when... These are women that are dating and married. You still want, let's go, let's go, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving, let's keep moving, let's keep moving. Now let me tell you this ladies, we, we have to look at this and say, is it right, am I hungry for righteousness? Bro, if, if we look to all the people you follow, oh, Pastor, no, she's doing workouts, she's got like shorts on and she's pulling and, Bro, 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 why don't you look at men? Women, and, women have a different autonomy, and they have a different body shape. Why do you have to look at women like that? You, can you tell me that you really hunger for righteousness, or do you hunger for pleasure? What we watch on, on our social media, what you watch on Netflix, what you watch on, on, on Prime or Disney or any of these other platforms, you're watching 18 movies. Even the world says there's a lot of sex in here. There's a lot of violence here. There's a lot of stuff going on here. The unsaved warn us. The unsaved warn us. Are we hungering for righteousness? Can we sit in front of this? And say, I'm so hungry for righteousness. Let me watch this. Actress and actors, lipsing up, naked, rubbing up, and you're watching it. I'm married. So you don't have to hunger for righteousness no more? Because you're married, you don't have to hunger for righteousness? Do we hunger more for entertainment? I've been working hard. Don't take this from me, Pastor. Jesus is saying we must hunger. He's saying you need to hunger for righteousness. How you speak to your spouse and treat your spouse. Do you hunger for your own way rather than righteousness? See, the truth is some of us hunger for relationship more. Do you hunger for righteousness or hunger for man? 
Do you hunger for righteousness or are you hungering for woman? Because you have, you're not dating yet, you're depressed. Remember we said when things are starting to go wrong, you have to go back to your foundation. Do you hunger for money more than righteousness? Some, we, we, we would sell our values for money. We would forsake our values, our convictions for money. Pastor, we need money. Ain't no one paying my bills. I pay my bills. I know. We all have bills. People have always had bills from before you were born until when, our, when you're dead and gone, people will still have bills. But we must hunger for righteousness. Do we, do we hunger for being popular or to be comfortable? I remember when I was in church, I was a young disciple, and I remember this lady came in from another church. She was a nice lady. She came in from another church. She liked what was going on in our church because South London at the time was a lot of young men getting saved. We were seeing loads of young men getting saved. And um, the church just blew up, loads, loads of guys. And, and so we were, you know, we were unchurched guys, you know, two, three years before that. We were just on the road living life like normal guys. And it's very rare just to see all these men get saved. And we were truly saved, living for God, principles and all of these things. But, we, you know, so she came from another church and there wasn't really much men in that church, no young men in that church, just pure old men in that church. Hey, listen, I love, I'm an old man now, so I love the old man. But I'm just saying we should have young men. Christianity, Christianity is a young movement. All the disciples were teenagers, late teens. You need to get young people saved. This church always gets young people saved by the grace of God. And then we get established and all of that. But anyway, so she comes in, she like that. And so she's come from this other church. So she comes in. And then I remember someone said, hey, we're going around Sister So-and-So's house. She's having a house party. I'm like, what kind of house party is that? They started to break it down to me. They're going to be playing worldly music there. They're going to turn off the light and boogie-woogie all night. <laughs> there were some people in the church, I remember, they were getting excited. And what I realized is, because this is what they were hungry for. See, just because you're in church, it doesn't mean you're not hungry for the world. I was like, I'm not going to that. I was like, listen, I, I, a year ago, I could have went to every rave I wanted. I've been to every party, every type of thing, most things I've been to. Literally, hip-hop. One time someone took me to this house thing, and they were going, ah, 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 all night. I was like, what are they doing here? It was mad. They, the one dance, the whole time. The whole night. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I was like, what's this? I've been to all these different things, and none of them fulfilled me. None of them gave me hope. When I came into the church, I did not come, I did not come to church for more of that. But there were people in the church, and they said, oh, yeah, we're going to go to that. See, this is, this is going to be good. This is what I've been waiting for. So you're in the church, but you're hungering for the world. You're looking for excuses. To make the world Christian. Because we hunger for these things. Let me just say this to those who are single. And will be dating soon. When you date someone, find out what they're hungry for. Find out what they're hungry for. I thank God that I've never had to pull my wife to church. I've never had to pull my wife into ministry. I've never had to pull my wife into a sacrifice. I've never had to uh, uh, persuade her to, oh, come on, we've got to do this, come on. We're always on, because I don't, she's, she's already, she, when I met her, she was already hungry for righteousness. You can't put that in somebody. Don't kid yourself thinking, I'm going to get this person, and then afterwards, I'm going to marry them and make them hungry. No, you're going to be dragging them do you know how hard it is to run a race, run a marathon? Imagine trying to run a marathon with someone on your back. No wonder you're weary. No wonder you're tired. Sisters, uh, 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 you, you, you'll be worn out when you're saying to her, hey, can we go Bible study? Oh, I don't want to go Bible study. Your husband doesn't want to go Bible study. Can we pray together? I don't want to pray. Can we read a book together? I don't. He has no hunger for these things. He has no desire for these things. 
He wants the world. You need, no, 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 no. You stay there. I'll stay here. When you get hungry, call me. No, 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 no. Not hungry for me. Hungry for God. I need a man that's hungry for God. And every woman needs to say, that's what I want. I want a man who wants Jesus more than me. Let me tell you why this is good. See, 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 there are some women here, you wouldn't want me because I'm too on it for you. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want me because I'd be, I, I, I'd come in and see you watching that. What's that? Turn that off. That's not playing in my house. You'd be like, I don't want that. That's right. You don't want that. I told you. I want to wear this. You ain't wearing that. There's going to be pure beef in this house. See, already some of you, you, I'm shocked you with this. But let me tell you, I get it. You don't want that. You want someone you can do what you want, when you want, how you want. But the problem is this. When he's out of the country, you don't trust him. Now, why do I say out of the country? Because this year I was in Ghana. I went there by myself. I'm in a hotel by myself. When I was in the hotel... They had like a, 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 they had a hotel party going on Friday night. They were playing, and it's obviously gone as Africa. There's no revelation there, but they were playing, they were playing ragga music, man. That's my music. It's like zoop, 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 zoop. The whole place was shaking. The whole Friday. I was getting ready for revival. I was, I was like, oh, my days. But there's nothing in me that I'd be like, you know what? Let me go down by the pool. It's a pool party. That I'm bound by the pool and then I'm, my wife has no worries. Yes, it's a package deal. I am radical. I am on it. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I'm continually seeking God. And to some of you, oh, that's too much. But the issue is, what comes with that is he can trust me. I can fly around the world. I can counsel people. I can be on the phone with different sisters and counseling them. And she is in peace, thinking he's not up to something. Because in her heart, she's seen my life. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. You need to find someone who is hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Hunger is a sign of health. You know, recently I was sick last week, about a week and a half. This cold flu, I don't know what it was. But I lost my appetite. And my wife knows that I was getting better because my appetite came back. See, when you're losing your appetite for righteousness, something's wrong. You're getting sick. You're getting sick. Remember what we said? We started by this poor in spirit that I realized I have nothing to offer God. I'm empty. Then we mourn. What God needs is righteousness. This is what it is. You stand before God, poor in spirit. I know that when I come before God, I have nothing. If I go into my vault, where's the righteousness? Ah, I don't have no righteousness. I'm poor, God. I have nothing to offer you, and you need righteousness. Poor in spirit, then we mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. They'll be comforted. God, I'm sorry. I don't have any righteousness. God comforts us. Then we're meek now. Okay, I'm, I'm meek. I'm I'm teachable. Show me what to do. The next thing is where we are now. Now I hunger for it. If you, if you, you've got to go back to the foundation. Are you poor in spirit? Have you mourned over sin? Are you meek yet? If you don't have these, it will affect the hunger. God is not looking for perfection here. How many thank God for that? God is more concerned. What are you hungry for? That means sometimes we make mistakes, we sin. How many know we make mistakes? We go off the rail sometimes. Sometimes someone does play something, you go a bit, whoa, hey, I love that. And then you're like, God, forgive me. Because when you're hungry for God, you realize you can lose yourself for a bit, but then you realize, no, where's God? No, 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 I gotta be over here. And God is like, I need people that, not perfect, 
I'm not perfect anyway. None of us are perfect, but are you hungry? Are you hungry for God? Are you hungry for righteousness? Let me close with this. God is the only one who can satisfy the soul of mankind. Listen to me. God is the only one that can satisfy your soul. Every single one of us wants to satisfy, satisfy our soul. It's just the difference is the way we go about it. Many people have not diagnosed their soul hunger. They don't realize it's your soul that's hungry. We try to fulfill it with money, with relationships, with uh, position, with power, with alcohol, with drugs. But it's your soul that's hungry. You just haven't diagnosed. It's a soul hunger. That's why you do these things and then afterwards you're still hungry. Because it's a soul hunger. But what this text tells us is Jesus guarantees fulfillment and satisfaction. Jesus guarantees fulfillment and satisfaction. Every Christian here, you can be satisfied and you can be fulfilled. Every single Christian here, you can be satisfied. You can be fulfilled because Jesus guarantees it because he says in our text, they shall be filled. When you are hungry, God says you shall be filled. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says this. 20, Jeremiah 29 13. Follow along with me. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. When you start to get hungry for God, you'll see a different side of God. There'll be a different level of fulfillment that God's going to, but he's waiting for you to be hungry. He says, if you seek me with all your heart, Matthew 7 verse 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Do knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone, for everyone, not the pastor, not the leaders, not the bishops, not the deacons, not the praise and worship, not the ushers, for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened meaning that when you and I start to hunger we will get more Jesus how many here you want more Jesus get more hungry he says if you get more hungry you'll get more Jesus if you get more hungry God will fill you more of the Holy Spirit. Some of us, ah, oh, you know, Holy Spirit fill me. No, 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 you've got to get hungry for God. You will experience a deeper sense of satisfaction that you've never felt in your life when you become hungry. It is guaranteed. It is guaranteed, church. It is guaranteed. Pastor, I'm weary, I'm tired. I'm exhausted, I'm going through this, 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 I'm going through all of this, and I get it, and I sympathize with that. But God guarantees fulfillment. He guaranteed it. Why are you not experiencing it? Why are you not experiencing it? The Bible says we've got to get hungry for it. We've got to believe him for it. Some of you may admit today and say, you know what, Pastor, I don't have that. How do I get it? Three things very quickly. Admit that you lack it and ask God to make you more hungry. Just ask God, say, God, I need to get more hungry. Some of you need to pray that prayer today. God, I'm just not hungry as I should be. I'm distracted. Second thing, surround yourself with people who are hungry for the things of God. Not everybody in this church is hungry for the things of God. I'm just being honest. Not everybody in this church is hungry for the things of God. If you surround yourself with people that are not hungry, you're probably not going to get hungry. You need to find people who are hungry. You know what we usually do? We, we find like for like. Young people want to hang with young people. Old people want to hang with old people. Jamaicans want to hang with Jamaicans. Africans want to hang with Africans. Mixed race people, I don't know who we're going to hang with. There's only not many of us. <laughs> but can I tell you, forget those boundaries. White and black can unite. <laughs> you don't, we, we don't care. Young and old can unite. Rich and poor can unite. Educated and uneducated can unite. If that person is on f fire, if that person has a hunger, say, listen, I need to spend time with that person. What you'll find, if you think about it now, just think about it in your head. Think about it. 
people that you'd be like, mm, they're not very, they don't seem to be very hungry. You see how they hang together? Anyway, let me move on. Some of you didn't like that because it was too true. Ooh, silent. Third thing, remove things that remove hunger. I remember my mom used to always say to me, Courtney, don't eat that. You're going to ruin your appetite. Sometimes what we're doing is we're doing things that ruin our appetite. God, I want more of you. Pastor, I feel depressed. I feel anxious. I feel lonely. I feel this. I feel that. I'm not fulfilled. I'm going through all of this stuff. I get it. Get hungry. But the problem is, and this is the hard thing to break out of, and this is why we've got to pray and need God, is that what you're feeding yourself Sometimes it's social media, just scrolling, 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 scrolling. Sometimes it's just other things. I don't know what it is. Only God, let the Holy Spirit reveal that to you. But some of this stuff that you're doing here is killing your hunger. You have no hunger anymore. Sometimes you've got to shut things off. Sometimes you've got to get rid of things. This is why fasting is so powerful. Because what you're doing is you're denying your flesh. And how many know when you start fasting, things become a bit more clearer? It's like, what's going on here? Oh, yeah, God's speaking to me now. You become more sensitive. Sometimes it's not just food. You've got to break away from other things. I pray that God would speak to you right now. That if there's anything that's stealing your hunger, that God would put his finger on it by his Holy Spirit right now and say, this is why you're not hungry. God is challenging some of you. If you would seek me, all the things you want, I'm going to do. The miracles you want, you're going to experience, but you've got to get hungry first. Remember the three things. Ask God to make you hungry. Surround yourself with hungry people. Remove things that remove hunger. In the world, they tell us to pursue happiness. There's a movie, The Pursuit Happiness. I've never seen it, but I've, I've seen what it is. Will Smith's in it, I think. I don't know what it's about. But it's, a, it's an alter, the pursuit of happiness. The world... And what the world is telling us is pursue making yourself happy. That doesn't exist. And let me explain why. Is that true happiness comes when you find something bigger than yourself. And you give your heart, your mind to this thing. And it's through accomplishing it. Through adversity. Through the adversity. Through the challenges. And you accomplish this thing. That brings true happiness. When you're just seeking happy, like, okay, what makes me happy? I get up at this time, what makes me happy? I'll eat this, what makes me happy? I'll say this, what makes me happy? I'll do this. Eventually, if you just do those things, it's going to be bad for you. How many know if we just eat what makes us happy, it's going to be bad for us? If we just do what makes us happy, it'll be bad for us. And so we pursue happiness, we lose righteousness, and we end up unhappy. But... The God never told us to pursue happiness because where he says in the scripture, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. That word blessed means happy. So what God is saying, happiness is the byproduct of hungering for righteousness. It's a byproduct. It's like if you walk on the beach, how many, a sand beach. You can't walk on the beach without getting sand somewhere. I hate sand beaches. You walk and you, even if you try to, you're going to get sand somewhere. What God is saying is, as you walk in righteousness, happiness is going to get on you. As you pursue righteousness, you find happiness and you become righteous. If you pursue happiness, you lose righteousness and you will not be happy. Today, let us become hungry for righteousness. I want every head bowed, every eye closed.